Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, why Marlborough Gallery has closed, Rose B. Simpson's public sculpture for the Madison Park Conservancy and Caravaggio's final painting. After 80 years in business, the Marlborough Gallery, one of the most historic commercial galleries in London, New York and beyond, has announced that it's closing. I talked to Annie Shaw, one of our contributing editors, about what happened and what, if anything, it tells us about the market. The New Mexico-based sculptor Rose B. Simpson revealed a newly commissioned public artwork in Madison Square Park and Inwood Hill Park in New York on Wednesday called Seed. The art newspaper's editor in the Americas, Ben Sutton, went to meet her. And this episode's work of the week is the final painting ever made by Caravaggio, the martyrdom of St Ursula, made in 1610. The painting is travelling to London for an exhibition opening at the National Gallery next week called The Last Caravaggio, and Francesca Whitlam Cooper, the gallery's acting curator of later Italian, Spanish and 17th century French paintings and the curator of the exhibition, tells me more. We have a new subscription offer for the art newspaper. Subscribe for as little as 50p per week for digital and £1 per week for print or the equivalent in your own currency. Visit theartnewspaper.com to find out more. Do also subscribe to this podcast and to our sister podcast, A Brush With, wherever you're listening. The latest episode of A Brush With features a conversation with Michael Raydecker. Please also give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, last week it was announced that the Marlborough Gallery, one of the best-known commercial galleries in Britain and the US since it was founded in 1946, is to close. Annie Shaw, one of our contributing editors and a regular reporter on the vicissitudes of the art market, has been following this story and I spoke to her to find out more. Annie, Marlborough Gallery has announced the bombshell that it's closing. Should we just talk a little bit about the origins of the gallery? Because I think for people who are relatively new to the art world, they won't know the kind of significance of the Marlborough Gallery in the market. Yes, yeah, it's a good point. I mean, as you say, bombshell news. But the gallery has somewhat storied origins. Marlborough Fine Art, as it was first called, and there have been various names for the gallery over the years, was founded in London in 1946 by Frank Lloyd. Frank was a Jewish immigrant who served in the British Army. And while serving during the war, he met Harry Fisher, an Austrian rare books dealer. So they established Marlborough Fine Art. A couple of years later, they were joined by David Somerset and Lloyd's son, Gilbert. But the gallery, and I don't know if many people actually know this, the gallery started out exhibiting impressionist and post-impressionist artists. Very early on, they had a show of of the complete collection of Degas bronzes, Mm. one of which was acquired by the Tate. And, you know, to organise a show like that was an extraordinary undertaking, I think. Yeah, because that's the thing is that those of us who have had a familiarity with Marlborough over the years, we think of them as being very squarely located within a particular group of artists in London, especially. But yeah, as you say, modernism was their thing to begin with. And it was only gradually that those sort of titanic figures like Francis Bacon and Lucien Freud and Frank Auerbach and so on started to join the gallery. Yeah, that's it. I think it was, you know, it was during the 50s and 60s that the gallery really made its name for what we know it as working with the cream of the British crop, like you say, those big names, Bacon, Freud, Auerbach, Barbara Hepworth. But, you know, I think at that time, Marlborough really set the agenda in terms of of an exciting and fresh exhibition programme. And that included things like, I was looking at their archive just a moment ago. Which is fascinating. We must urge our listeners to go to the Marlborough Gallery archive. It's just online and there's just great pictures and invitation cards and all that kind of stuff. Really, really worth checking out. It's a wonderful resource. And things that popped out to me were things like Art in Revolt, which looked at German art between, you know, 1905 and 1925, which is terribly avant-garde, you know, exhibitions I had no idea that they hosted very imaginative things. They set up in Rome after London and then there was this move to New York and we've dug out this from that archive this extraordinary report in the New York Times from 1963 which announces that arrival in New York Mm -hmm. and I had no idea what a moment that was in the New York art world. It's extraordinary reading it back. Yeah, quite. I mean, like you say, I think today we're so sort of blasé about galleries opening all over the shop. But at that time in 63, to open a major outpost in New York was such a big deal. And again, they hoovered up, you know, much to the annoyance of the New York dealers that this this New York Times article indicates, you know, Sidney Janis thinking... (laughs) God, these people are on my tail. Yeah. But they hoovered up some of the abstract expressionists, Robert Motherwell, David Smith, Clifford Still. I think they worked with the estates of Jackson Pollock, whom they'd already shown in London, Franz Klein, Ad Reinhardt. So again, you know, this sort of incredible 
list who's who in the in the New York art world. There's a brilliant quote from that New York Times piece. I'm just going to read it out mm. because it just gives a flavour of it. It says, although some dealers welcome the arrival of a gallery as powerful and influential as Marlborough, others, especially smaller galleries, seem to feel that Goliath has landed among them. <laughs> so it's that sort of sense. I don't think I had grasped until I started looking back through the archive just how much of a kind of major player Marlborough was and how, as you say, like Sidney Janis quaking in his boots at the arrival <laughs> of this gallery that made its reputation in London. Yeah. yeah, it's such a lovely, lovely detail. And sort of interesting to know that this poaching that the megas are so sort of known for was happening back in the 60s. It sort of it was ever thus. Yeah. And, and then there was this seminal moment, probably the most important exhibition that Marlborough ever did in terms of how they received now, which was the Philip Guston show in 1970, which, you know, it's difficult to overstate how much of a kind of seismic shock that Philip Guston figurative art show had. We just had the big retrospective, which related it all. And, you know, that was a Marlborough Gallery show. That show was so important. It caused such a fissure in that community and so on. So you get a flavour from that, just how influential it was again. Absolutely. Yeah. And then through the 70s and 80s, they kept picking up major artists. I'm thinking particularly like people like Paul Arago and so on. Yes, exactly. I think, you know, if you look at the roster over the years, there's been sort of quite a diverse scattering of artists. You know, we mentioned some of the post-war titans. We mentioned Philip Guston. They've also worked with the estate of Kurt Schwitters, Mark Rothko. You know, there was a big scandal in the 70s involving Rothko's estate, which has sold paintings to the gallery for under market value. And this led to a huge legal case and in fact Lloyd the founder having found to have tampered with evidence but alongside these artists you mentioned Paula Rago there's Gillian Ayres Dennis Oppenheim Nam Galbo you know the gallery also has spaces in Spain now and there they represent the likes of Antonio Lopez Blanca Minos there's the architect and sculptor Juan Navarro Baldweg so it's a really diverse roster and I think this might be something to do with why the galleries come undone slightly and then add to that there's been this, this sort of attempts at reinvention through things like Marlborough Contemporary, which came a bit later in 2012, and Marlborough Graphics. Let's talk a bit about that contemporary side, because when I first started visiting Marlborough Gallery, it was, it was early 90s. And so by that stage, for instance, they picked up the artist Therese Alton in the 1980s, and she'd been shortlisted for the Turner Prize and things like that. So there was a sense in which it was engaging with a contemporary scene. But of course, in the 90s, that was when new players came on the scene. And so I think Marlborough, for me, even though it represented contemporary artists, it almost felt like a secondary market space mm. in some ways it just didn't feel like it was right at the cutting edge and they may not have been seeking that but it was a reliable space to go and see good art but clearly it didn't feel like it could create seismic tremors anymore of the kind that we were talking about yes quite i mean it was slightly before my time but not i'm you know, not here to <laughs> outage you but it was just slightly um, but yes in, in 2012 which is sort of more my era they launched marlborough contemporary and this was under the eye of andrew renton who wasn't from a commercial background you know he was a curator and a professor at Goldsmiths. He's still a professor at Goldsmiths. And he was tasked with bringing on a number of contemporary artists who I think were relatively unknown, certainly in the UK. Um, at that time, there was sort of Jao Onofre, Angela Ferreira. I mean, I think she represented Portugal in 2007, I want to say, at the Venice Biennale. So she had mm -hmm. a certain platform and standing already. But Adam Chotsko, Jason Brooks, Ian Whittlesey. I think I'm missing a couple there, but I think only Jason Brooks remains on their roster. So it sort of gives some indication of what stuck from that venture. And I think, you know, the idea with Marlborough Contemporary was to have the two businesses running alongside each other. You know, Marlborough Contemporary was on the first floor of the London Gallery. And I think they shared a booth at Art Basel at least on one occasion. So there was the idea that they were sort of going to be complementary programmes. But, you know, again, this attempt to diversify didn't quite stick. And Andrew Renton ended up leaving in 2017. And I think shortly afterwards, Marlborough Contemporary sort of quietly closed. Right. Yeah, I can remember it launching and I can remember thinking, oh, that's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. It definitely felt like it was probably necessary at the time. But yes, as you say, it didn't quite stick it and, and ended up sort of going quietly into the night, really. It didn't really make the kind of impact I think they were hoping it might. Yes, no, I think there was sort of reports of a sort of potentially a new beginning or sort of injection of new blood, but never materialised. And of course, by that stage, we did have the mega galleries on the scene in London, for instance, Gagosian had obviously begun establishing itself very solidly, as had House and Worth and so on. So it was a different market entirely, really, wasn't it? So what are they saying now then about the reasons for closing? Because this is an interesting thing. Is it, is it sort of fizzling out or is it more complicated than that? 
It's a bit of a complex picture, and I think it's been a bit of a slow demise, as our colleague Melanie Gurlis you know, wrote in the Financial Times. I think that's a really good way of putting it. You know, the official line is that currently the gallery is being managed by a board in Switzerland who really have no relationships with the artists with whom they work. And in an industry like ours, which relies so heavily on those personal relationships, I think that's almost impossible. Mm. But of course, there's been a number of other things been going on, some of them very high profile. You know, the Bitter Family feud at the top of the gallery, which has been widely reported, and also reports of, of financial losses over the past few years. Tell us about the family feuds, the, the lawsuits and so on, because that went on for quite some time. It's been settled now, but it was really quite bitter. And I remember sort of reading about it in the newspaper a fair amount. Yes, exactly. So it's, it's a little bit complex, so to bear with me. But the, in terms of the family, on the one side, there's Gilbert Lloyd, the son of Frank Lloyd, who was the founder, who anglicised his name from Levi. And on the other side, there's Frank's nephew, Pierre Levi, who ran the gallery in New York for several decades, and his son, Max, who took on his father's role in 2019. Max was ousted by the board as president in 2020, I think while his father lay in hospital with COVID. So both parties ended up filing lawsuits. The Levi's alleged that the board had tried to damage their reputation and the Lloyds alleged that gallery funds had been mismanaged. Documents from those lawsuits revealed that the business reportedly lost almost $19 million between 2013 and 2019. So in June 2020, when Max Levi was ousted, the board announced that the New York gallery was closing. So this is not the first time we've heard this. That announcement was then walked back and the gallery in New York remained open. But there were rumours at the time that Marlborough was trying to find a buyer for its inventory. And, you know, huge question marks clearly still hung over the future of the gallery. As you mentioned, the lawsuits were apparently resolved, again, quietly. There's not been many reports about that. But a spokesperson confirmed to me last week that the lawsuits were resolved to the satisfaction of all parties. And they also told me that the family issues had nothing to do with this decision to wind down the business. So take from that what you will. <laughs> right, exactly. And now the other thing which has been really notable is that, for instance, an artist that we mentioned earlier on, Paula Rago, left Marlborough Gallery to go to Victoria Miro. And mm. she must have been a huge money earner for them. And I, her reputation has soared ever since, but she was already on quite a high plateau in terms of her, her reputation. Exactly. I mean, I think Paula Rago defected to Victoria Miro in 2021, around the same time as her Tate Britain retrospective, which would naturally have an effect on her market. I mean, that was shortly before she died. Frank Auerbach, I understand, it's not quite so clear, but it's my understanding that he also left around the same time as three long-standing directors resigned from Marlborough in May 2022. And they were Geoffrey Parton, Frankie Rossi and John Earl Drax. And, you know, these directors had worked for the gallery for decades. It seems like the departure of those two artists and major players in the business as a whole, that sounds like a terminal disease for a gallery, really. I think so. And in fact, you know, filings on UK's Companies House published in January this year reveal that the London Gallery specifically, their turnover dropped 35% in 2022, while gross profit fell by 24%. And the accounts specifically cite the departure of the directors. They cite just one major contracted artist as contributing to these quite significant financial losses. Right. So what happens now then? There's this inventory, supposedly, is it 15,000 objects? Yeah. And, you know, various estimations as to how much it's worth. But do we have any sense what's on it? We don't really know what's in the inventory. I mean, obviously, we can safely assume it's a mixture of post-war and contemporary art. You know, <laughs> according to a 2021 article in the FT, when it was announced that the New York Gallery was being wound down, there were rumours that the UK property developer, Johnny Sandelson, was, was interested in buying the business. And that included its inventory. And that was then valued at $250 million. I've been trying to sort of ascertain what that $250 million relates to, whether it includes properties or just the art. Sources close to the gallery say it relates just to the art, but it's not clear whether there's been a more recent valuation. I mean, obviously, there have been fluctuations in the market since 2021. And I also would say that even though $250 million is, is a lot of money to you and me, Ben, hmm. it does indicate that there are very few blue chip masterpieces left, you know, the sort of $50 million mark masterpieces that we might have once associated with Marlborough. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's five Francis Bacons, right? 250 exactly. million. So yes, yeah, so yeah. That, yeah, good point. Now, they're saying that there are going to be non-profit institutions that support artists that will benefit from some of the funds made from selling those works. Do we know anything more about what those 
non-profit institutions are because I guess there are a wealth of such institutions out there. Yes, yeah, and one would hope that there was some sort of support perhaps for some of the the newer artists who have joined Marlborough, some of the younger and emerging artists. But at present, we have no information on that. I understand that Marlborough are in active conversations with some charities, but we just don't have any details on who they are just yet. Okay. So lastly, how significant a loss is Marlborough? How much will this closure impact the wider art world? I mean, look, it's definitely a significant loss. It's one of the sort of longest standing galleries in London and New York and elsewhere. But it's, you know, as we've discussed, its demise has been a long time coming. I mean, certainly for longer than the current softening of the market. So I'm not sure how much this is an indication of a wider problem. I mean, what is increasingly clear is that it's so difficult to talk about the market as a whole. We've always discussed it in terms of a sort of loosely grouped set of sub-markets, but that sort of feels perhaps truer now more than ever. An advisor pointed out to me the other day that Paraffin has just announced it's closing after 20 Mm. years in London. You know, a different market, very contemporary, but they cited the economic climate. So business is clearly not easy at different levels of the market and costs have gone up. We all know that. But I think in the case of Marlborough, I just think it lost its edge. It lost its footing. It became stale. And I think the combination of the losses of Rego and Auerbach, coupled with those major directors in 2022, they had those deep relationships in the market. And that's, you know, just enough for a business to become unsustainable today. Annie, thanks as ever. Thanks, Ben. You can read more on this story at theartnewspaper.com or on our app, and you can find out more about the gallery's history at marlborougharchive.com. Coming up, Rose B. Simpson's public art project in New York and Caravaggio's final work. That's after this week's news bulletin. Archaeologists working at the ancient Roman city of Pompeii have revealed beautifully preserved frescoes in the Black Room, a banqueting hall in a newly excavated part of the site. It's the latest stunning find from Pompeii, which is almost perfectly preserved beneath ash and pumice deposited by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79. The two frescoes show scenes from Greek mythology and literature. One presents Paris, the Prince of Troy and Helen of Troy, and the second depicts the Trojan priestess Cassandra and the god Apollo. As a banqueting the black room would have been used to entertain guests at night. Its walls are painted black, probably so that smoke stains caused by burning lamps would not be visible. The room also features a well-preserved white mosaic floor. It's just one part of a larger house with a reception room and garden, while next door there was a bakery where skeletons and a shrine were uncovered, and beside that, a laundry. The Vietnamese-American multimedia artist Din Q. Le has died at the age of 56. News of his death prompted shock and sorrow across the international art community and particularly in Asia. As well as exhibiting around the world, including in Documenta 13 in Kassel in Germany in 2012, the 2003 Venice Biennale, the 2006 Asia-Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art and the 2008 Singapore Biennale, in 2007 Le founded the non-profit arts organisation SanArt in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam to help young artists. Katie de Tilly, founder of his Hong Kong gallery, 10 Chancery Lane, said Din Q. Le was not only a great artist, but a really great man. A tribunal in Tasmania this week determined that a piece of performance art by Kirsha Kaicheli at Tasmania's Museum of Old and New Art, or MONA, contravened anti-discrimination law. Under the decision by Tasmania's Civil and Administrative Tribunal, MONA has 28 days in which to stop excluding men from Kaicheli's work, The Ladies' Lounge. The installation opened in 2020 as a protest against the exclusion of women from gentlemen's clubs. It admits only those who identify as women. The one exception is the butler, who serves champagne to women visitors who can sit on phallus-shaped furniture. An Australian resident, Jason Lau, visited Mona in April 2023 and was unhappy to find his $35 ticket did not give him access to the lounge. He filed a complaint with Tasmania's Anti-Discrimination Commissioner and this led to a legal dispute that was heard in the tribunal which found that Mona was in contravention of the state's Anti-Discrimination Act. To read these stories and much more, visit the website or the app. 
Now, on Wednesday, Rose B. Simpson unveiled new public sculptures in two of New York's green spaces, Madison Square Park and Inwood Hill Park, as part of the 20th anniversary of Madison Square Park Conservancy's art programme. In Madison Square Park, there are 17 eight-foot high figures, or sentinels as the artist calls them, in a circle around a female form who emerges from the earth. In Inwood Hill Park, one sculpture stands facing the wood, a reference to Native American histories embedded in the land, while another looks out to the Hudson River, by which settlers arrived in the native lands that are now Manhattan in the 1600s. The themes of Simpson's work connect deeply to personal as well as collective Native American experiences. She's an indigenous artist, having been raised in Santa Clara Pueblo in New Mexico as part of a multi-generational, matrilineal succession of artists working with clay. Ben Sutton, our editor in the Americas, went to Madison Square Park to meet her. I guess I wanted to start by asking, you know, obviously this is like a very kind of intense space to work in. You're dealing with, you know, a lot of noise, a lot of traffic. There's like skyscrapers and there's just like so much going on. There's other statues. Like how did you, from the get-go, kind of like approach this quite unique and hectic site for this project? I think this is a, a special place. When Brooke first invited me out, I got to wander around and sort of listen to the place. And I did hear all the sounds and I got to feel the sort of immensity of the buildings and that make the trees kind of small even though these trees are massive. Um, This place really feels like a bowl and so that was one of the first things I noticed was the sort of vessel-like nature of this space because even though it's a park it's not Central Park. You know every direction visually there's buildings and so there's this holding feeling of it and it does it has a lot of visitors and it feels like a place that people really depend on so it it feels like a a treasured and special place in this wild geometric experience of city life you know yeah it's sort of this anomalous like circular resting place amidst the like geometry and the chaos yeah exactly what inspired me for this piece was how the buildings really felt like the walls of this space and in a sense they become sentinels for this moment of connection and peace you know which i felt just first being here yeah well i guess i wanted to ask you know about the the figures in your piece so there's the seven sentinels uh the sort of 18 foot tall steel pieces around the perimeter and then the smaller kind of bronze figure in the center. And then all the tall steel pieces have both these faces that are kind of looking out, the sentinels, and then this face that's looking inward, not quite at eye level, like sort of at like child level. I'm curious sort of like why you felt like looking out and looking in and and sort of having these like multiple points of vision, sort of what that meant to you and, and kind of how you hope viewers experience that. Initially, the faces of the tall beings, the sentinels that are facing out, are these large, like, three-foot uh, masks made out of steel with, with um, bronze turquoise eye bars. Um, and those are looking out in a protective manner. And that was sort of the intention to make these faces sort of watching. They're all eyes that are open in all the directions so that the central piece can close her eyes and be present and sink down into the present, into the space. And she'll be sort of overgrown with indigenous plants and in that she will sort of sink into place, into past, into presence. And the large pieces that surround are protecting and making space for that intimacy and vulnerability, really. So they stand on guard so that the central piece can be vulnerable. Then along the bottom facing in, at about child height, are seven small faces that are watching her. Their eyes are open and they're witnessing her vulnerability. They're witnessing her moment of self-awareness and self-consciousness and presence, deep presence. And I think that what that does is it talks about sort of responsibility and accountability in relationship. Relationship to place, relationship with historical awareness, uh, future responsibility, the relationship to place and our environment, be it industrial, human built, or our natural environment. So we have the, the large pieces, the large faces looking out in a protective way, also seeing context. And context also includes history and histories and historical stories. 
And then you have the being in the center who is in her present. And then the small figures that are facing in and watching her are the future. And to me, I often think about the young people are watching me to see how to act, how to be in the world. And I'm still trying to figure that out, right? I'm trying to be self-aware enough to make informed decisions on what that looks like. And the best thing I can do is to show self-awareness to the next generation so that the next generations will know how to carry us forth because we are, we are only a link in this life. You know? So this project is not only here in Medicine Square Park, but also uh, way uptown in Inwood Hill Park. And there you have these two figures, one sort of like looking into the forest and one looking out on the Hudson. I guess I'm curious if you could sort of talk about how this group of works here in Madison Square Park relates to that group of works, or if you see the two installations as sort of distinct and doing different things, or kind of how you see them in relation to each other. I mean, I feel really lucky to have privilege to have them in both spaces. And I keep thinking about the presence at Inwood Hill Park as so much of the awareness of me being a guest. And, you know, as someone who is indigenous to a place, and I'm not indigenous to New York, but I know what it's like to have an ancestral relationship and history with an environment, with a place, with a colonial history, and the, all the feelings that come with it. And so I think I have a perspective about being a guest that makes me think about how I act and how I carry myself as a guest in someone else's home. And I think that that isn't just about our present human cultural condition, right? But it's also about the manner with which we carry ourselves, that we are a guest in this body. We are a guest in this life. We are a guest in each day, you know? And so how do we approach our relationship to place with reverence and respect? And I think that the lack of <laughs> is what causes entitlement and which what causes us to feel like we have the right to take or to harm another person. And so this is the way I approach historical trauma, but also, you know, our current political situations, etc. is that, you know, how do we become self-aware and how do we consider all the aspects of things so that we can be considerate and self-aware and self-conscious and careful. And so the piece in Wood Hill Park is a miniature, are two miniatures of some of the sentinels here in Madison Square Park. And they are facing in and out. And there's a large face facing into the forest and a large face facing out to the Hudson, a small face facing in, a small face facing out that it is our small parts of ourselves and the large parts of ourselves, the way we witness. And we show up with a sense of witnessing that considers all parts of things. It considers history, considers the present, it considers ourselves, it considers each other. It's thoughtful and heartful. It's deeply witnessing past the mind and deep into the parts of witnessing that I don't think um, we practice too much these days. Right. And I'm one to talk because, you know, this is all me teaching myself how to be in the world. Well, it's on all of us, you know, and I <laughs> feel like hopefully there's a way in which, like, yeah, people seeing this work become more self-aware or, like, have that awareness or it provokes some kind of deeper understanding or deeper awareness, at least. Yeah. You know, I keep being caught by this piece and how much it's teaching me, even though, in a sense, I was the translator of what I was told to create, in a sense, when it first was planted when we planted this in Madison Square Park and I stepped back and I almost didn't get it until I had to see it and then it keeps teaching me it keeps teaching me about relationship keeps teaching me about collaboration keeps teaching me about accountability and responsibility it keeps teaching me about being conscious and aware of myself and that's not always fun to be aware of ourselves right but it is I think through those rough points, there's some real beauty we can find. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I really like the idea that the figure in the center of this installation is going to sort of slowly become overgrown. And I imagine also, you know, this is a deeply man-made space, but there are also there's also nature. So I can imagine there will be like squirrels and birds. Like the interactivity of, of the landscape, such as it is, I think is going to be a really beautiful thing to see over the evolution of it. Yeah. Send me pictures. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask, you know, you, you sort of like have alluded to this, but obviously Inwood Hill Park has this kind of infamous historical 
baggage of being the site where the Dutch sort of quote unquote purchased Manhattan Island from the Lenape. And then here in Madison Square Park, like this is sort of like, you know, we're in the shadow of the Flatiron Building, which was the tallest building in the world when it was completed, kind of like the birth of the skyscraper era. And so much of Manhattan was built up by like Mohawk steel workers who built the skyscrapers. I guess like both projects feel like they're hinting at this kind of history that New Yorkers and kind of tourists to New York, like people aren't necessarily aware of or just kind of don't think about that often. I'm curious like to what extent those histories informed how you approached the project or if they're kind of just like part of the larger picture of what you want people to think about. I think because of my own experience of place and watching how colonization transforms an indigenous reality, that everywhere I go, I always expect, you know, on this continent, I think about what places looked like before colonization. And it's just a habit, I think. But that habit also comes with heartbreak and frustration and some confusion. But I don't know how many people do that. We just go, oh, this is how it is. And then we, that's where we begin to just take things for granted or consider, you know, this is just how it is. And so I do think about, you know, what happened and what was it like to be from here? And what was this place like before colonization? And what were the relationships to place? What were the memories that were made? And then you think about not just pre-contact, but through you know, the industrialization of this place, through enslavement, through all those layers of trauma, right? You know, and you think about the height of these buildings and fear. I think so much about fear and how we navigate fear. And I, when I think about Mohawk steel workers, you know, I think about courage and I think about not just courage, but also um, the denial of fear. And I wonder how much the denial of fear makes us do certain things, right? Because it's a denial of a hard feeling that makes us cause trauma. And so a lot of these buildings had to be built in a denial of fear in a sense. And I wonder how much of that intentional dissociation of difficult feelings exist in this city in so many ways, you know? Yeah. And how much that denial perpetuates our behaviors and how much we can start sort of rooting ourselves back down. And even this piece, you know, for me, 18 feet is really tall, <laughs> yeah. right? And here they look so little yeah. next to the world, and yet they're the biggest thing I've ever made. You know, an El Camino is 17 feet long, right? These are 18 feet, so it's a lot big. It's the biggest thing I've ever made. And yet this being is rooting herself deep into the ground. Like, we have to have balance. As yeah. far up as we go, we need to go deep as well. Yeah, yeah, sort of about balancing the kind of upward momentum with, like, actually being rooted in place and having some connection. Yeah, and connection to place and grounding, but also within and without, right? Yeah. So obviously, in addition to this piece here in Madison Square Park and the piece up in Inwood Hill Park, you also have a piece or I guess four pieces that form a piece in the Whitney Biennial. So you're kind of all over all over the <laughs> island, which is very cool. But yeah, so in the Whitney Biennial, you have this group of four ceramic mixed media figures called Daughters Reverence, um, and each piece has its own individual title too. Does that piece kind of function in a totally different manner as far as you're concerned? I mean, obviously that's like really got like your handprint on it in a very literal sense. And, you know, is working in a, in a museum space as opposed to a public space. Like, does that particular work you know, feel like it's in conversation with these bigger outdoor pieces, or do you consider that kind of like a separate project? I mean, I think that because I'm at a phase in my life that what I'm investigating internally is going to translate on the outside no matter what. This Madison Square Park piece was in the works long before the Whitney happened. I think that the work for the Whitney was more, you know, oh, this is what I'm dealing with, this is what I'm investigating, this is what I'm translating from my own personal work and so it will inevitably be related because I'm sort of going through <laughs> you know the same thing in a sense but what I see from all three has a lot to do with boundaries and thresholds which I think started when I was working at the fabric workshop and museum I did a big installation there where there were spaces that were inaccessible to the public. Hmm. And that was super important for me. And I started realizing, I think I started investigating how the work itself can hold itself. And rather than be performative, it can be functional. It can be sort of doing its own work. 
right. and the viewer witnesses the work being done, but it's not necessarily, if you grow or be informed by the work, that is because of the, the work you did in reception to the work, but it's not didactic. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily giving too much, right? And right. so I feel like what I find similar between this work and what's at the Whitney right now is that they're both kind of making an environment. They're taking space for the work to be done. But specifically the work at the Whitney, they're in relationship to each other. And they're doing this work with each other, in a sense demonstrating if one chooses to do the work to understand it fully, how to be in relationship, right? They're figuring it out with each other. Right, right. right. It's these sort of four figures facing right. each other, but not the viewers. So you're kind of, like you were saying, like a witness to their communal moment. Right, and they create a tension between them. They create a visceral space of relationship between them that's not necessarily you know, for anyone to walk into, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the difference, I suppose, about the Madison Square Park work is that, you know, the viewer will be able to walk in and around them. But the big faces are way above anyone's head. They're looking at something further and bigger, almost on a level of supernatural. And so I feel like that's what I'm sort of looking at and investigating and building a relationship with is, is thresholds and dimensions and making spaces that are almost psychological or spiritual even. So you have two big shows coming up later this year, a big show that opens at the Cleveland Museum of Art in July, and then another show at the De Young Museum in San Francisco that opens in November. Do you feel like those are sort of like, in a way, building on the work that you've done here and at the Whitney and in Wood Hill Park, or are those kind of their own distinct bodies of work, or sort of what can we expect from those shows? We're working really hard. I have an incredible crew right now at my shop. And we're building these large, larger than these, 24 to 27 foot tall figures. Two of them that will face each other. So I feel like, again, we're playing with sort of that tension between two beings as they witness each other. Mm -hmm. And this one, you know, you pass through the tension between them. And I feel like I'm excited to see those and experience those in place at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Those pieces are called Strata. And then we're actually working on um, finishing another car that will be at De Young. So I will have my original 85 El Camino show car, Maria. Nice. And then um, we're working on a 64 Buick Riviera with hydraulics that's going to be at De Young. So that's very different in a <laughs> sense. But yeah. it is also about the vessel. It's about yeah, space. It's about relationship. It's about the aesthetic present. So it's fun. It feels like there has been a lot of planning and building for many, many years, and it's all sort of coming to a head <laughs> yeah. last year and this year. So, you know, this is a marathon and we will push through it. And I'm so grateful for the support of me and my voice. And I don't know, I'm just humbled by it. And I feel sometimes overwhelmed, you know, but also like trying to maintain a deep sense of wonder so that I can be open to what it all has to teach me. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat. It's nice talking. Rose B. Simpson's seed is at Madison Square Park and Inwood Hill Park in New York until the 22nd of September. The Whitney Biennial, even better than the real thing, is at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York until the 11th of August. Rose B. Simpson's strata is at the Cleveland Museum of Art in Ohio in the US from the 14th of July to the 13th of April 2025. And Rose B. Simpson lexicon is at the De Young in San Francisco in the US from the 16th of November to the 29th of June next year. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. In 1610, Caravaggio made a painting depicting the martyrdom of St. Ursula for a Genoese patron. Though he'd recently experienced a violent attack that left him badly scarred, he was then hopeful of returning to Rome, where he had made his reputation as the greatest artist of his age after being banished for murdering a man in 1606. But he never made it back to the Italian capital, dying soon after the Ursula painting was completed. That ultimate picture will next week come to London as part of the exhibition the last Caravaggio at the National Gallery and I spoke to its curator Francesca Whitlam Cooper about the work and those final troubled years of a great artist's life. 
Francesca Caravaggio's last five years in a very turbulent life were extremely turbulent. Can you give us a flavour of where he was in May 1610 when he came to take on what was his very last painting? You're quite right. He lives a very turbulent life, but this really reaches a new kind of peak in 1606 when he kills a man in Rome and is then forced to flee the city with a death penalty, a bando capitale, on his head. So he has to flee the Papal States. He goes down to Naples and is hugely successful there, spends time in Malta, where again he's painting very successfully, though you know, his personality is such that he's endlessly getting into trouble. He's in Sicily. May 1610 finds him back in Naples. He's been there since the autumn of 1609. We know that he's painting. We know also in the autumn of 1609, he is really violently attacked, leaving a bar in Naples. And that, that attack really seriously disfigures his face. You know, according to the, the contemporary sources, this is a really violent attack. The fact that it's a facial wound suggests there's something there about kind of honour and he has dishonoured somebody. Perhaps this is a sort of revenge attack. So he's been convalescing. So by the spring of 1610, he is better, though perhaps still weak from this attack. He is painting and he doesn't know it, but he's painting his final painting. What's extraordinary, as you've hinted there, is that through all the turbulence and in Malta too, he, as you say, even though he was trying to become a friar at that time, which is rather mm. amusing, well, he gets involved in some sort of altercation and therefore has to flee again. So, But all the time he's painting and also we know that he's painting some of the greatest works he ever made at this time. Yeah. He has this amazing ability to sort of, and perhaps it's, this is partly what propels him, but he has this amazing ability to create extraordinarily rich works, extraordinarily detailed works, extraordinarily time-consuming works, all the while living this incredibly violent personal life. No, he absolutely does. And, you know, for me, I think about his time in Malta, you're quite right. He goes off to Malta because he wants to become one of the knights of the Order of St. John. You know, the idea of ennoblement, of having that title and that recognition is really important to him. And he goes and he's there for a year and he does it. You know, he becomes a knight and he, he has this success, but it's almost... To me, there's something kind of Shakespearean about Caravaggio, like that tragic flaw that mm. it's almost like he can't let that happen because then, as you say, there's this huge fight, this altercation. He's thrown into a dungeon prison, supposedly escapes. I mean, clearly with some help, but with ropes and a boat and everything else getting <laughs> to Sicily. But it is an extraordinary life. And as you say, what's even more extraordinary is not that he's not painting or that he's turning out dud works. It's he's mm. actually turning out masterpieces in this period which is, is pretty breathtaking. Now, the commission comes to him. Tell us about who commissioned him to make this martyrdom of St Ursula. So he is commissioned by a Genoese nobleman called Marc Antonio Doria to paint a martyrdom of St Ursula. And that's what he's working on. He's just finished working on in May 1610. He's probably known Doria for several years. We think he's probably met him when he's been to Genoa earlier during another period of violence in which he needed to leave Rome for a little while. So there's already a kind of connection. Doria is based in Genoa, but he has a business agent, Lanfranco Massa, who is working for him. And, and he has lots of property in Naples and a strong connection with Naples. And so the painting is rediscovered as a Caravaggio, if you will, partly on the evidence of this letter that Lanfranco Massa writes to Marc Antonio Doria from Naples to Genoa in May 1610, talking very explicitly about the painting. It's amazing, isn't it? That We'll come on to that because there's some really yeah. interesting details that emerge from that in terms of the sort of conservation of the work and so on. But OK, so he's got this commission. How strict is the commission in terms of scale and so on? Because this is not one of his largest works, but it has a very tight focus. Do we know anything about what the nature of the commission was? No, we don't. And that's not untypical. So we know that the painting is made for Marc Antonio Doria, we know that it is a martyrdom of St. Ursula. It's been suggested, I think, very plausibly that perhaps one of the reasons Doria is interested in St. Ursula in particular is that he has a stepdaughter to whom he's quite close, a woman called Livia Grimaldi, who is in Naples at this moment and she is professing. So she's taking on, you know, a religious life as a nun in Naples under the name Sister Ursula. So that seems too strong a coincidence for there not to be some sort of link that must surely explain why he's commissioned Caravaggio to paint a martyrdom of St. Ursula, which is quite an unusual thing to paint in this period. 
Right, absolutely. But there's no sense in which this is a portrait of her or anything like that. There's no detail like that that we know. No, there's no detail in which this is a portrait of her. Obviously, there's the self-portrait of Caravaggio included. Mm. And again, that's this sort of intriguing detail that we see Caravaggio in the background. It's the last time we see him. He's there with this kind of deathly pallor on his face, peering over the shoulders of the soldiers and of Ursula herself, watching the action. It's very sort of morally ambiguous because is he a witness to the scene? Is he trying to stop it? Is he culpable in some ways? Is he impotent? You know, there's lots of kind of questions raised by that. He's not disfigured though, is he, crucially? We know that he's just had his face slashed, but you'd never know from this depiction. You would not know from the painting. And that to me is very interesting as well. Again, also thinking about the fact that he knows Marc Antonio Doria. So it seems unlikely Doria would have requested Caravaggio's self-portrait. That Mm. feels more like a sort of in-joke for someone who's going to receive the painting. Oh, oh, you know, there we go. But he casts himself in his very famous light, which I love. There he is bathed in that incredibly dramatic light, which is his trademark, I guess. Absolutely. And, you know, this is a painting of incredible chiaroscuro, you know, these Mm. extraordinary kind of contrasted, you know, lights and darks, which is exactly what we know Caravaggio for. And obviously, you know, it's incredibly tempting to you know, to make something metaphorical of that and to think about this period in his life as kind of one of darkness and light. You know, he's been through all this violence. He's been on the run for so many years. But just as this painting's being finished, he's getting word that perhaps he's going to be able to go back to Rome. So perhaps the long for pardon is coming through. Perhaps he's going to be able to resume his whole life. So for me, you know, I look at that self-portrait of Caravaggio and yes, there's this incredible light that he's bathed in, but it's funny actually, if you look, he's sort of almost looking beyond the picture frame. Mm. It feels almost as if he's looking to what comes next. Well, that's it. He has a bit of hope after so much darkness, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Tell us about the composition because St. Ursula quite often is depicted because the legend of St. Ursula is about the 11,000 virgins. And so artists love that subject. Of course they do. And so therefore make a lot of it. But here you wouldn't know that. I mean, it sort of has to be explained to you that it's St. Ursula really, doesn't it? It absolutely does. And for a long time, it lost its identification as a martyrdom of St. Ursula. I think precisely because when you look through the history of art, when people have depicted that story of this British or Breton princess who's gone on a pilgrimage to Rome and then she and her 11,000 virgin followers have been massacred by the Huns. Normally, artists have kind of strewn battlefields of (laughs) of dead virgins. And, and, you know, there is this kind of emphasis on quantity, for want of a better word. I mean, I think that is what the story is associated with. And Caravaggio, of course, does something completely atypical, something very Caravaggesque. He strips the story down to, you know, the kind of bare essentials. We're looking at six or seven figures here. We are looking at life-size figures. The composition is very, very closely cropped. So as you stand in front of it, you really feel as if you are just there sort of watching this violent thing happen. And it's very condensed, you know, as your eye moves across the canvas from left to right, you have the Prince of the Huns who's just fired this fatal arrow. There's this extraordinary hand of a bystander that kind of reaches out, Mm. you know, too late to stop this awful thing from happening. You have Ursula's hands framing the wound, but it's all happening in the space of sort of centimetres. It's very compressed, very intense, very typical of how he paints dramatic subjects. I know that the painting has undergone a lot of conservation in its time, that its condition is not perfect, but the colouring of St Ursula is very notable. It's a deathly pallor. Mm. Is that Caravaggio's original colouring? Do we know? I mean, it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, it is a painting that has right from the moment it's painted in May 1610, had this kind of quite complicated conservation history. So this letter that is written saying, oh, Caravaggio has just finished this painting and everyone who's seen it is amazed, also includes the note that, oh, sorry, I popped it out in the sun to help it dry (laughs) faster and I seem to have done something funny with the varnish. I've got to get Caravaggio around again to fix it. Um, You know, so, I mean, literally from the get-go, you know, there's clearly some sort of conservation concern. We know there's another incident later on when it's shipped back from Genoa to Naples where packing material sticks to the surface. In terms of what we're looking at, though, in terms of the contrasts, you know, for me, having thought about it, having spoken to a lot of people, you know, the kind of consensus, it's hard to imagine that that pallor on Ursula or indeed the pallor on Caravaggio himself, they're not accidental. Those aren't just the effects of pigment change or, you know, not seeing the painted surface exactly as we would have seen it in May 1610. I think that is quite a deliberate choice. And for me, her pallor, you know, it plays into the expression on her face as well, which is very complicated. It's sort of 
surprised but accepting and every face in this painting is very difficult to decipher I think I think that is one of the things that yeah. makes it condition issues notwithstanding you know a very powerful work that's right she's there's an almost a serenity about her isn't there and I guess could that be interpreted as relating to the fact of you know her knowledge of her own martyrdom I guess that you know that, that she has the serenity of faith I guess yeah I, mean, I think that is a big part of it and I think you know, certainly one of the things that we've tried to do in the exhibition and in the catalogue is to talk about that and write about that quite intentionally, because I think it is very easy to, you know, talking about the martyrdom of St Ursula, these are things that are happening to her. It's quite easy to put her into a kind of passive voice, whereas actually I think there is a different way of looking at that painting and saying this is a choice. I mean, she was given a choice by the Prince of the Huns. You know, he offered to spare her life if she married him and she refused to marry outside her Christian faith. It doesn't make what's happening to her any less awful. It doesn't make it any less abhorrent. But I think there is something, and I think Caravaggio is painting that, there is something about restoring a little agency to her and her accepting martyrdom and that's the price she is willing to pay for her faith it's really powerful it is indeed now tell us about the history of the painting after Caravaggio's completed it basically it goes to Genoa and then is it right that basically it stops being recognized as a Caravaggio for a very long time after that yes and no so it goes to Genoa and then it's in the Doria family in Genoa and it's in many inventories in the Doria archives as Martyrdom of St. Ursula by Caravaggio, St. Ursula um, pierced by the tyrant, Caravaggio, blah, blah, blah. Over time, though, that connection is severed. And I think that's just one of these inevitable things that happens, you know, and artists like Caravaggio fall very much from favour. It's not the kind of prevailing taste. So I think it's in the late 19th century that the painting is then returned from Genoa back to Naples, still within the Doria family to one of their properties there. Yeah, and essentially, you know, it gets separated both from the artist's name, but also from the subject. So by the middle of the 20th century, it's being suggested that this is a painting by Mattia Preti, who's a Calabrese painter, of, you know, one of Caravaggio's followers a generation younger. There's a suggestion it might be Manfredi, who's one of his kind of Roman followers. It's lost the connection to Ursula completely. And again, you know, that might also have been due to being under really thick gunky varnish not being so legible but for me the separation from the Ursula story is also because this is just a really unusual way to paint Ursula. And then we have to end with Caravaggio's end so as we were saying he's thinking it might actually get reprieve and be able to return to Rome in triumph and become an even greater painter with even greater patrons and so on but that doesn't happen does it tell us what does. It doesn't happen. So at the end of May 1610, the martyrdom of St. Ursula, as you said, is sent up by boat to Genoa to its patron. And just a few weeks later, Caravaggio himself is on a boat. He boards a boat from Naples up the coast because he's got word that this papal pardon is going to come through and he can kind of pick up life where he left off four years previously. And it's this sort of awful twist of fate that for once it's actually not particularly his fault because there's lots of things throughout his life that are absolutely down to him and his (laughs) violent temperament and this this particular sort of chain of events actually isn't so he lands and is mistakenly arrested for once he doesn't seem to have done anything he is mistakenly arrested but what that arrest involves is him being separated from his belongings so all his belongings the paintings he's made for his supporters in Rome everything he owns continues in that boat up the coast to Porto Ercole. And he is uh, something like 50 or 70 kilometers further down the coast, absolutely desperate, because that's his whole life that sailed up the coast without him. So, you know, there's several contemporary-ish or 17th century biographies of Caravaggio, and they Mm. write quite poetically about him running up the coast, chasing the... I mean, he can't physically have been running, (laughs) but nevertheless, he was obviously very desperate probably still weakened from this attack in Naples. You know, there's been questions about, you know, it's a very malarial area. He picks up an infection and basically dies at Porto Ercole on his own, unmourned, a pauper, nothing to his name. It's a completely sort of ignoble end for someone who, you know, whether you like him or not as a person, his paintings did change the world. Indeed they did. Francesca, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. The last Caravaggio is at the National Gallery in London from the 18th of April to the 21st of July. 
And that's it for this episode. You can find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Alexander Morrison, and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Annie, Ben, and Rose, and Francesca. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week for a Venice Biennale special. Bye for now.